Good evening. The Brown Institute for Media Innovation is delighted to welcome you to our spring quarter speaker series with tonight's guest, technology journalist, Kara Swisher. My name's Ann Grimes. I'm the Associate Director of the Brown Institute for Media Innovation. As a veteran journalist who previously worked with Kara in both Washington and San Francisco, I'm excited, as I know you are, to hear from her about the current state of the media, technology, and our tumultuous times in Washington, where she's living these days. But before we start, let me say a quick word about the Brown Institute. For those of you who don't know, the Brown Institute for Media Innovation is a collaboration between Stanford and Columbia Universities designed to encourage support new endeavors in media innovation, both in developing new media stories and new ways and new tools to encourage uh, the distribution and uh, capturing of media and stories. The Institute was founded in 2012 through a generous gift from longtime cosmopolitan editor Helen Gurley Brown, whose husband, the film producer, David Brown, was a graduate of both universities. Brown funds grants that support small teams of students who bring their ideas to life by implementing a prototype, creating an innovative media project, or telling stories in new ways. We are excited about our work. Please check us out at our website, brown.stanford.edu. Now before our program gets underway, let me introduce our participants. First, Manish Agarwala. Manish is the faculty director of the Brown Institute here at Stanford, and also is the Forest Basket Professor in the Department of Computer Science. Manish works on computer graphics, human-computer interaction and visualization. His research focuses on understanding how people communicate through audio and visual media, and how cognitive design principles can be used to improve the effectiveness of audio and visual media. Manish earned both his BS and his PhD from Stanford. He previously taught at Berkeley and returned to Stanford in 2015. He is the recipient of many, many awards, including a 2009 MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, the, co the so-called Genius Grant. Car Kara Swisher. No idea. <laughs> You're speaking with a genius. Oh, Be careful. Right. Yeah, right. Kara Whatever. Swisher is a business and technology journalist, an author, an entrepreneur, a podcaster, an opinion writer, and maybe even still a wannabe San Francisco no. mayoral candidate. No. Okay. Kara has written. Sorry. <laughs> Kara has written for the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal. She is the author of two books. AOL.com, How Steve Case Beat Bill Gates, Nailed the Netheads, and Made Millions in the War for the Web. And there must be a pony in here somewhere, the AOL Time Warner debacle and the quest for a digital future. She has served as co-executive co editor of All Things Digital and is the co-founder of the tech site Recode, which was acquired by Vox Media. She does a weekly podcast, Recode Decode, where she interviews prominent figures in, from the technology world. In October of 2018, she became a contributing writer to the New York Times opinion section. A graduate of Georgetown and Columbia's Graduate School of Journalism, she has been called Silicon Valley's most feared and well-liked journalist. Please join me in welcoming my colleagues, Manish Agarwala and Kara Swisher. Well, 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 welcome to Stanford. Well, genius. <laughs> Let's hear it. Let's see your genius. So I did you really to... win one of those? How much money did you make? Uh, <laughs> do you really want to know? I do. I really yeah. want to know. Uh, so it was uh, uh, a few years ago, uh, and uh, the award is for $500,000. Whoa, really? Jesus, <laughs> I should do something worthy, but go ahead. <laughs> so, uh, well, I wanted to start by learning a little bit about your background, how you became the most feared and liked technology journalist. Right. Um, so, you know, you, you started out in D.C., yep. uh, covered the Valley for about 25 years. Yep. Uh, you started in so-called 
I'm going to call it legacy media, the, yes. the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal. Yeah. Uh, you went on to uh, build your own media venture, All Things mm -hmm. D. Was that rebranded? Re no, renamed? it was within the Wall Street Journal. And we just left Rupert Murdoch. Ah, okay. It's the easiest thing I ever had to do in my life. But go ahead. <laughs> Um, and then you sold it to Vox, and uh, and now you're podcasting. I, I, is it three podcasts, two. Po I have two podcasts. Uh, one once a week. One three to five times a week. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you write a column for the New York Times. Weekly. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so a, a lot's going on. A lot. And I, I just wanted to get a sense for how you got to where you are today. Wow, that's a big question. What the path was really. Uh, from the beginning? Where do you want me to start? <laughs> An abbreviated version. Abbreviated version. But, but you um, start you know, where you want. <laughs> I, 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 didn't, I, I don't consider it legacy media or non-legacy media. Just, you know, I work, I'm right now writing for the New York Times. I think it's a great platform. Yeah. I also wanted to write for all three major newspapers. I thought that was kind of fun uh, to, to have a troika of those. But um, I started off as a reporter, for the, just a reporter for the Washington Post covering retail um, in Washington, D.C. I actually started off delivering mail at the Washington Post. I was a mail person. Um, so I, was, I started in the mail room there. And I, wor I did whatever they threw at me. I did whatever story uh, that they gave to me and eventually worked my way up into a reporting slot. Did you know that you wanted to do journalism all along? Uh, no, I wanted to, I went to those, I was just telling people, I've been at Stanford all day today talking to people, students mostly, and um, I, I, wanted, I, I didn't get into Stanford and I didn't have the $6.5 million necessary to do so. <laughs> so um, I, uh, uh, my brother did go here, though, and he did not pay. He was pointing out to me that he didn't pay that either, but uh, and that he was much smarter than me. At Fifty years later, after we both graduated college or whatever, and uh, and so I went to Georgetown, the Foreign Service School, and I wanted to be in the Foreign Service, uh, not the Foreign Service. I wanted to be in the military, um, and I I'm gay, and at the time I'm older, uh, it was problematic. You, it was don't ask, don't tell. I couldn't be in the. My dad was in the military. He had my dad is dead, but. Um, I, I very much wanted to do military intelligence and CIA. I wanted to be in the CIA. I did, and uh, and so I I couldn't because I was gay. And uh, it, at the time, it's changed. Obviously, uh, not that much again. It's going back, um, but it's uh, it, it was something I wanted to do. And so I got into journalism. It was not unsimilar. I wanted to kind of be. If anybody watches Homeland, I wanted to be like her, but not crazy, um, and not and not so, slutty and crazy and stuff like that. So, so how did you get from the mailroom to tech journalism? Uh, I was I I, I, wor I went to Columbia Journalism School, uh, and I was again uh, offered a lot of jobs in places I didn't want to live in the country. Mm. It, it was a different time again. Being gay was harder to live in rural areas and and things like that, and I didn't want that life, and so. I decided to stop, start at the bottom of the top, so I worked at the Washington Post, and I literally just worked my way up. That's what I did. I filled in, and I worked in the business section, which was a backwater at the time, uh, until Barbarians of the Gate came out, and I worked my way up there, and I covered retail, and then when I did that, I did that really well. Um, they gave me the job of covering this. I was the young person on the staff, and so they gave me the job of covering uh, online services, which is what it was called at the time. And, People don't realize this, but a lot of the stuff who did go on in Washington, a lot of the telcos, MCI, and, and some other companies, because one of the main trunks of the internet, May East, is in DC. And so a lot of the original internet service providers were there. A lot of the original, you know, Vince Cerf was there, all kinds right. of people. And so I started covering it there, and AOL was there. Right. And so that's where I started covering it. And literally nobody on the staff wanted to cover online services, and I was struck by them almost immediately. I, under, I think I understood well before other people what they meant. I, I was very attuned to shifts in communications. I had studied propaganda and everything else like that at, at Georgetown, and so I really thought this was, this was a big, it was like the printing press. I remember thinking it was like, and same thing with mobile phones. I was very much enamored with the idea of mobility and, uh, and online services that connected information. So. Yeah, great. And then you came out here for a while? No, I was doing, I was writing for the Washington Post and I wrote, AOL was a local company yep. and a very small company. I met Steve Case super early in the game, uh, of that game. And while I was doing that, I got interested in all of them. And I met Yahoo very early. I met Jeff Bezos very early. I met all of them when they were, you know, 20 people, yep. like very small startups. 
and nobody was interested in them. Nobody was interested, and I was the only person that came around, you know, that was interested in them. And so I started writing a book about AOL, um, and in doing so, I met everybody. I met, and they were at the nexus of all of it, and I, uh, I met everybody, and I, um, and I uh, got to know them, and. I met someone I met along the way was a guy named Walt Mossberg, who was the t technology columnist for the Wall Street Journal, and he was the only person who spoke the language. I, it's like we spoke our own language. We understood what was happening, and so uh, he got me to come to the Wall Street Journal because he thought the journal wasn't didn't think this was important enough, and they right. didn't. They didn't think it was important, and mm -hmm. I think I was the first person to cover the internet for them as as a topic. Uh, they had a lot of media reporters, a lot of media reporters sort of crapped all over the internet stuff, um, and I was it. And so I came out here to San Francisco, and I was the only one who knew. Nobody paid attention to them in the 90s, in the mid-90s, very except until Netscape went public, and then everyone started to pay attention. So I met Mark when he was a, he was a teenager. When I was <laughs> wow. 19? So, he might have been 19 or 20. So this is Mark Andreessen. Right. Yeah. Um, Not the Zuckerberg. I met him when he was 19, too. So we'll get to the Zuckerberg. Right. <laughs> so, um, so, so, so you've really covered tech since its early days. Well, uh, no, I've covered the internet. The internet. I did not okay. cover, I, I did along the way meet Bill Gates and Steve right. Jobs and covered right. them, too. Yeah. But they were in computers. You know, right. there was like John Markoff is here. John is like the best reporter on technology, I think, in the history of it. Um, yeah. Uh, he's here tonight. Um, he covered a lot of that, that early, all the early. And so I didn't cover computers per se or chips or things. Mm -hmm. I, I was aware of them. You have yeah. to be aware of them. And I obviously knew, I did cover a little bit of Cisco and things like that. But Cisco was an internet company, it was providing, you know, uh, routers and, and servers for the internet. So I, I covered all the adjacent stuff, but it all had to do with internet. It right. all had to do with the internet. The internet and maybe by extension media. You know, yes, that, and then you got into, media, it was so. you know, they yeah. all shifted into media, inter yeah. internet right. went everywhere. Right. You know, music, and then I started covering that, and then when it went to this, it went here. Yeah. Just, it went everywhere. So yeah. I went with it. So I want to talk a little bit about the media landscape and mm -hmm. how journalism has, uh, has maybe evolved a little bit in its coverage of uh, the internet and media. Um, in particular, you know, in, in those early days, maybe this is just my perception, but it felt a little bit like the journalism was kind of a cheerleader for, for that kind of yeah. internet technology. Mm -hmm. And now in the last couple of years, I think we're, we're seeing a backlash against yeah. uh, those, those companies. And so, you know, the, the media has in a way kind of turned against Oh yeah, Tag. it's called tech lash. I think that's what they're calling it, right? Uh, you know, I've always been mean to them, so I feel yeah. like I've been persistently mean. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, it was interesting because we at Recode and before that, All Things Digital were always highly skeptical. We were not. I, uh, some of it right now, like there's been a couple of stories lately, and I'm like, that's ridiculous. Like some of them, we we're talking about one that yeah. I don't want to talk about publicly, but I was like, this is wrong. Yeah. This, is, I think, what it is is everybody. There were two things. There were people who were gadget reviewers who reviewed gadgets who were just loved the stuff. And it's like automotive writers who love cars. They're never going like, to love this car, love that. So there was that. And Walt was different than that. Walt was highly skeptical, and, but he liked the things he liked, and he didn't like the things he liked. So that's why I, I thought he was great at it. Um, but there was sort of a fanboy kind of mentality of making these people into celebrities. Uh -huh. And one of the issues was there was mostly men yeah. covering it, young men, essentially, who were just looking up to a lot of these people as, as celebrities or icons. And I wasn't particularly impressed with them from the get-go. Like, you know what I mean? They, I had covered a lot of business leaders, and I was like, they're just more business leaders. And I think one of the things that they tried to do was act like they were different that they didn't care about money and that they were here to change the world and they had ridiculous titles. I think I did a story in the Wall Street Journal, every stupid title card I have. I, it was that. And they were like, Kara, that's mean. I'm like, what's a friggin' chief Yahoo? Like, what the hell is that? Is that a job? How can I study for that? Uh, you, know, right. you know, you went to Stanford to become chief Yahoo? All right. Whatever, you know, or chief, you know, I forget. Chief happiness officer, are you HR, right, you're an HR, got it, okay. So I was always skeptical of all that bullshit. Right, right. But the food is delicious, though. I wrote a, I wrote a whole <laughs> column about all their, their uh, a, a story about their weird cafeterias right. originally. Um, you know, I, would, I studied them like anthropologically, right. and I think I was always tougher on them. Right, so right, I was, hence most feared. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, but you know, but it's. I, I think it's gone beyond you. I think the media is a little bit more 
uh, skeptical of, of what these companies oh, are doing. And yeah. any, do you have a sense for why that's changed or what's, well, what's happened in the last few years? Well, I think probably the 2016 election, I think. Um, yeah. you know, the, I think Facebook has been at the forefront. Right. You know, Facebook sort of worked all of our last nerves for many years before this. Like the Beacon thing, they were always up to some shitty little behavior. They just were. They've always, <laughs> there's always been like, oh, Mark, once again, here you go again. It was always some privacy violation, right? It was always some, Beacon was, if you would call Beacon, I don't know if you remember, you don't, I remember all of them. They had a thing where they told, they were creepily following people around and then you began to recognize it and then they did the I'm so sorry. That's where the FTC <laughs> stuff came in. That's right now what's going on was an old thing. I see. But they, they were, they, they, Right now, they're sorry for the thing they were sorry for what they were sorry for. And so they were always like that in terms of, of, of abusing their access to people's data. And I think what happened in the 2016 election was, uh-oh, now it matters, right? It's not just them taking your stuff and selling it to prop whoever and, and mashing it up or whatever the hell they do with it. And then I know what they do with it, but you know what I mean. Like, it's just, um, it, it became serious when it looked like the Russians, and I think most people except for Donald Trump do agree that the Russians did somehow use social media to, to, uh, to um, distort and disrupt the election. And we'll never understand what happened, but these systems were certainly uh, part of it, in a, a significant part of it. No, yeah. It's not everything. You're not going to, you know, whatever, how many million people voted for him. But it, I think that's what it was. It was like, just a second, this matters. Right. And so I think that's probably, probably Facebook is, I think most t other tech companies blame Facebook for sure. And, you know, and, and now your role as, a, as an opinion columnist is also somewhat to, to critique these yeah. companies. Yeah. So how is that different from, you know, kind of writing about the companies in a, well, in a more you know, repertorial we, way? At, at All Things D, we pioneered a different kind of reporting. Like yeah. we did, we, we had a lot of scoops. We were big on the scoops. We got everything that happened. We had a sort of, we knew everything that was happening, who was getting fired, who was not getting, we covered a lot of that. But within the, um, within the coverage, we also had a lot of opinionating. And I don't mean, yeah. it was informed opinion, it was reported right. opinion, right. but we came to a conclusion. And one of the things, as the end notes from the Wall Street Journal, they have this thing I call the to be sure statement. Do you know that no. in journalism? Let me explain. When you write a story, like I was write, working on a web van story, I think it was, or it's something like web van, which was a disaster at the time. But it was directionally correct, as it turns out. Um, I had, I think it was Reb, it was one of these companies, and I, it was, I had done the reporting, and it was very clear the numbers didn't add up. They just, this, this is ridiculous. This is a one VC funded bullshit, like essentially. And so I, you know, I go back, I'm like, this is gonna fall apart or something. And they were like, well, Carrie, you need the to be sure statement. And I'm like, what is that? And they're like, to be sure, some people say this could work. According to the venture capitalist who has every reason to say so, or analyst idiot, you know, whatever. <laughs> To be sure, some people feel this is a big, giant market. It's a trillion dollar market, blah, 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 blah. To be sure. Right. And so I was like, to be sure, it's going to close down and everyone's gonna lose their money. And yeah. so it's grandma with the stock. <laughs> and so, I, and I used to get so frustrated. Like, why can't I say I've done the reporting? I'm pretty smart, I'm a good analyst. I'm gonna make a conclusion. I'm gonna, I'm, and if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. If I'm right, I'm right. Like, that's kind of thing. And so, and that to me was what readers wanted. They didn't want the, they didn't want the, you know, you'd come to a conclusion after doing amazing reporting. Right. And so I was tired of that. And so when I started, when Walt and I started All Things D, we were like, we're just going to say what we say to everybody in the newsroom. We're just going to write it. And so we had writers like Peter Kafka, like he'd say, Comcast did this, but let me, let me break it down for you why they did it. Like, right. here's the real reason. Here's what's really going on right. here. And I think we, we talked in that, col not colloquial because we're good writers, but we were very much tell it like it is kind of people. And we would even do things visually. Like Eric Schmidt used to always make mistakes as he would say stupid things as the Google CEO and then he was chairman, he'd always say something real dumb. Like every three months, something dumb, something crazy dumb. And it was always like, and all the PR people were like, ah, she just said this. And then they pretend they weren't upset by it, but everybody was upset by something he said. And so we did, we did a picture, it was very tasteless, of, of, of a ball gag on Eric Schmidt's no. mouth. Oh, no. <laughs> you can go look it up. Go look up ball gag, re, uh, all things digital. And every time he would do something, we'd write a very straight news story of Eric Schmidt today said this, it was controversial, and then it would just have the visual of the ball gag. <laughs> and we, and he would, he'd call up, he's like, I don't believe you did that. And I'm like, what? 
is there a ball gag on your face? Like, what do you, but it was like, it was sort of like the tattler. It was like, true, he wow. should stop talking. And it was great. So we would do stuff like that. Or we would say, Eric Schmidt said something stupid today. Like, rather than some people think Eric Schmidt said something stupid. So we did, we pioneered that. Yeah. Uh, so that was, people seemed to like it. Right, so you, you came to conclusions, but you also maintained a kind of balanced perspective in the sense that you know, you had evidence for the. We were the always right. We were. Right. We did great reporting. <laughs> <laughs> we were. We were never not right. I don't think there was anything we got really wrong. Right. Like, right. you know, I kept saying, "Yahoo's a trash dump. It's a trash dump." And everyone's like, "To be sure, some people think it is," and I'm like, "I'm sure it's a trash dump." And here's why. And so we would do that. Like, no matter what they threw at that, right. that wasn't. That was. That it was being run into the ground by a series yeah. of CEOs. No matter how you you sliced it. And so I thought that was helpful. My constituents weren't Silicon Valley people. They're the readers or investors or whoever's doing it, but we also did it fairly. It was never, it was never not done fairly. Right. And so I think that combination, and it was, some of it was funny, and like I had a, I had a thing where I, uh, well before these, I had a flip camera. Yeah. I used to like show up at things and point it in people's faces and go, hey, how you doing, Mark Zuckerberg? What's going on? He's like, what? And I'll go, are you selling your company? And he'd be like, what? <laughs> and then I just publish it. Right. Like, why not? Right. Like, here's right. my, meet this person. And I think we were doing all kinds of innovative stuff like that and we were very heavy on Twitter we did all when that came we were on it um, pretty quickly um, so I think we and now everybody's doing what we did yeah so it was interesting yeah. what we used to do well it, you know for for the kind of journalism that you do people are doing you know this, a similar kind of thing yes but absolutely. For, for news it's very different right, right. And, and one thing that we were sort of offended by was that we were doing the blog fashion the way blogs were but a lot right. of the blogs around at the time were just terrible and they were in the pockets of people right. and so we thought why don't we take all the good things they're doing and then do really good journalism against them yeah. because because regular journalists were like we cannot do, like I was at a meeting at the Wall Street Journal once, because the Wall Street Journal owned all things, too, uh -huh. even though we were kind of a skunk works within, right. all thing, with, within the Wall Street Journal, um, with all the issues that that brings, all the tensions <laughs> within a big organization. And what was really interesting was we're in a meeting and some, some one of the reporters, and by the way, I was a better reporter than all of them, so I was like, don't even tell me about being, a, you know what I mean? They were like, <laughs> they're like, you know, you could make a lot of mistakes. They would, you know, blogs make a lot of mistakes. That's, that was their thing. They were so snotty about blogs and stuff like that. And I said, wow, you made 20 mistakes last year. And they were like, what? And I said, I've checked all the mistakes. You think, should we go through them? Because some of them are quite serious. And they, they, they just, they, were, they didn't understand that there was something great about the, uh, there's something very muscular and interesting about the way blogging was done. Right. Um, and they resist, regular media resisted it, and then blogging didn't have standards, and so we were trying to mush the two together. Right. That was what we were doing. So, you know, we're in, we're in an interesting time in terms of media mm -hmm. and trust in media. And right. I'm talking more generally beyond, you know, kind of the tech journalism blogs or, right. you know, what Recode is today. And, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm wondering how much you think that mistrust in media is warranted by the public mm -hmm. and what we might do to kind of reverse that and, and Well, let me it. push back. Yeah. Are we? Is that true? Or are we never have been liked at all before? I don't think there was an idea. If you go back in history, if you actually go back and do the actual reporting, mm -hmm. nobody's ever liked the media. Mm -hmm. Never, never, never. Go back to, you know, Hamilton friggin' hated the media and he was also part of the media. Like, you uh -huh. know what I mean? Like, he's the first Twitter guy, as far as I can tell. <laughs> you know, it, they were long <laughs> Twitters, but um, more than 140 characters, but all of them participate in a very ugly press uh -huh. Situation. It, Lincoln. Oh my God! You read some of that stuff, and so and the press has never been. The idea that that we have been well liked is not is a fresh new thing. Um, well, for most a, of us. I would argue there's a difference between likableness and trust, and I, I think trust has gone down. Though you know, I don't have firsthand knowledge of this. Right. Um, yeah, uh, and, and the media is sort of under attack uh, from a number of sources. Well, it's uh, one source. Yeah. It's right now, yeah. of course, if someone repeats something <laughs> over and over and over again, and yeah. then the rest of the cronies go yeah. into it, sure. But that, that's, that's the whole point of, you know, I study propaganda. That's yeah. what they do. You repeat yeah. it three or four or six right. times, right. and so then it becomes equalized, and then they're like, well, didn't I hear? Yeah. You know, one of the fascinating things that Trump uses all the time is, you know, many say, mm -hmm. Yep. Nobody says it. Just him. Just him. That's it. <laughs> and many, you know, many agree. Many, right. I've heard it from many people. It, you know, he never leaves that White House, so right. it doesn't like he, there's nobody he's talking to. But 
you know, I don't know who he's talking to, that guy who does his tweets with him, that Dan Scott, whatever the hell his name is, but um, Scavino, Dan Scavino. Um, but I think that we have to not think of it that way. The tr I don't think people, I think what's happened is the media has, I think you have to separate things out. You have to separate out things like cable news, which no question has turned into the loudest, noisiest thing around. And that's not just Fox News, by the way. All of them, they're all like, oh, Jesus, I can't watch them anymore. Like, right. I can't, they offer no insight and a lot of noise. And I think that's problematic. Those are, those are hugely problematic because they become very partisan on, on all sides. Um, and it, Fox started it, for sure. They started doing the, that stupid fair and balanced crap that they pretend they're doing and then the others joined in like everyone's joined in and so that's the that's one of the problems is cable and then you know s reporters i think have got because uh, the, the way social media has worked the lid has been taking off of everyone you know everyone's been like that's enough like you know what i mean and so when say bill barr says one thing yesterday and you can find that he said the opposite three months ago you cannot help yourself but to just say, boom, boom, fucking liar. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's right. what you, do you know what I mean? Like, you're like, yeah. like, so I think that's what happens. And there's no way to be dignified about that. I right. just, there's, it's hard to be dignified. And so I'm not so sure people trusted the media that much before. <laughs> I don't think they did. I don't think they did. I think they had a little period during Watergate, but that was about it. So. You know, one of the things that uh, journalists are starting to do is uh, they're using more and more computational tools in their work, mm -hmm. uh, in their reporting, yeah. to un and they're also uh, uh, starting to think about how to unpack algorithms mm -hmm. at play in the various sure. you know, platforms and so on. Um, do you think that journalists should expand on their ethics policies to kind of aim for re reproducible results when they're using these kind of scientific methods to... M meaning what, uh, specifically? So, so, you know... If they're doing a data journalism project? Right, if they're doing a da data journalism project, if yeah. they're uh, using algorithmic techniques to... Yeah, to they, why query not? Why shouldn't they? Yeah, they should say how they did the it. Data. Sure, so people can examine yeah. it. Yeah. Should, should they publish the data? Sure. Should they publish the code? Why not? Like, what are you how should of? they... Yeah. Yeah. I would, yeah. Yes, if, yeah. as long as it's good. Yeah, as yeah. long as it's good data. I think I'm fascinated. You know, I just did a podcast, I think we talked about it earlier, with Julia Angwin, who... Mm -hmm. The big mess at the markup, it's sort of sorting itself out still. Um, but you know, one of the things she's focused in on is like, let's let's test this. And one of the things that was interesting, the podcast we did is she's like, we tested a thesis around something around Amazon that didn't turn out to be true, which was right. great that she tested it, right. and then it wasn't a story. But then they came across a different story that's right. doing it. And so yeah. I think that's what's great about it is the ability to say, here are the numbers, and it gives you very hard to argue with and can have, have some real change if you, if you have really good data. I think a lot, of, a lot of journalism is three anecdotes and you're out, right? right? And that's right. the proof, I hate that. Right. Three people say, this is what's <laughs> happening. But well, I think I, I think Julia Angwin's approach is, is very exactly. interesting. The, you know, using the, applying the scientific method yeah. to uh, you know check hypotheses, right? Uh, and changing the hypotheses as as well. You need certain to. stories it works very great. Some right. are just news stories, like right. this happened in Congress yesterday. Right. Some things are just beautiful stories that tell someone's life story or something yeah. like that. And some things are. Again, three examples, and you're out with a trend story, which I can't stand those stories. But, but do you think that there's a way in which that kind of scientific approach can make the journalism more trustworthy, or people will, will trust it more? I'm not sure these days yeah. anybody trusts you know, yeah. anything. Like, yeah. you can put in front of, you know, I don't know, I have a Fox News watching mom, and it's real hard <laughs> to get anything by her if she's had an hour of Hannity. That's, it's, it takes me three days to, to hit, talk her down from the wall. <laughs> like literally, they were it was something. What was it? Something the other day, and she goes, "It was something awful. It was something a terrible lie. I always forget it. it was a terrible lie by someone in the administration." And she's like, "But what about Hillary Clinton's emails?" And I was like, "What? Like, why are we talking about her fucking emails? She's not. She's a citizen." Well, I know, but Hillary Clinton. I'm like, she's a private citizen with no power. Like, she is not the president. And yet, and I was like, she has no power. And like. Well, that's true. It took me like at least 20, you know, she's a private citizen with no power. Yeah. 
just her mouth, essentially. She can just talk. And it was fascinating. So I don't think it doesn't, even if you present people with, with ironclad evidence, I think it's much harder these days to get through to them. So it, it, that's what's difficult, is that the truth has become political, and which is exactly what this, these groups are trying to do. They're trying to make the truth political and therefore debatable. And that's, that's, that's worrisome in lots of ways. So um, you are also a media entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. um, and we're also in an age where many journalism organizations are struggling. Yeah, some and are. So, I, I, I wanted to get your thoughts on the business models around journalism and what you think is uh, maybe a way forward for journalism organizations sure. like yours. There's lots. I yeah. mean, we've been doing, look, we've been, uh, we've been doing the, our version of the conference for 16 years. We, we decided diversification was a smart idea 16 years ago. Yep. So we started in the events business. And when I started in the events business, I'll tell you what, everybody criticized me. Mm. Like, oh, you're doing events? You're charging for them? But you know. You can't have speakers and then charge people. I'm like, why? You charge people for the newspaper. Well, I don't pay the speakers to come. I don't pay for them to fly there. I don't do anything. I'm doing an interview on stage. It's live journalism. They're like, and they kept trying to find a problem. And I was like, it's, I'm doing what you're doing. I just don't publish it in little type. I just talk, you know? And so it was really, it, it, we, we started doing that it literally was 16, 17 years ago when we started doing the first one. Because my son, I know how old it is because of my son's age. Um, because we started right when he was born, um, the year after he was born. And so, you know, we thought about that early. There's been subscription ideas, like the information. That's another way to go. Um, podcasts happens to be advertising-based. Uh, uh, there's sponsorship models, which I think the conference is like that a little bit, sponsorship models. There's um, newsletters that you can pay for. There's, there's all kinds of different interesting ways. I think what it is is that journalists have to become entrepreneurial and they're not used to being entrepreneurial. Many are not. And, and that they have to get used to the fact that some things are going to work and some things aren't going to work. Uh, and, and, switch and switch when things don't work to something else. Makes, makes sense. Journalists are the least risk people on the planet. That's the issue. <laughs> I often think, I'm, always, I'm fascinated, like we always are like, we, we make, I'm, I've done a lot of business stuff, so I feel a little yeah. bit on firmer ground on that because I've created businesses, created jobs, not big, giant ones, but, um, but pretty big, big enough. And, and sometimes that they don't have business backgrounds when they're writing about businesses sort of irritates me too. Um, so, but they're very risk averse. And they're very, they're, they're often journalists tend to be the first people to say why something's bad without studying it. Now, it may be in fact the case but I really, and there's some amazing investigative journals. I'm not talking, this is about business journalism versus, you know, if there's a water leak or, or water, water poisoning or something very serious or opiate addiction. That's a very different kind of journalism. Um, but there, there, there are worries about that serious, like people covering immigration, people covering gun control, those issues that are, are climate change. Very challenged in how to pay for it. You know, it's easier for me to make money because I do business journalism and advertisers like it versus stuff that's very critical that we have journalists looking at, local news, for example, local governments. That, I, I wonder how we figure out a way, a business model there. Those are the ones I'm worried about. Yeah. I'm not worried about business journalists. I'm not worried about tech journalists right. and stuff like that. Well, there's the issue of accountability, and I think that's really important for the local journalists. Yes. And there's tech accountability, and that's something that you know you're doing, and mm -hmm. other and other organizations are are starting to do. Right. And uh, and I think that's very interesting. That, you know, they're related to. to well, you know, I mean, I think we have Mark Zuckerberg covered. <laughs> like we all watching him real carefully now. I think he's right. not. We're not. Right. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. I think what I'm worried about. If I had to put. If I if I was younger, I would focus on local journalism. Like yeah. how to get local. journalism journalism into, I try to think of a business model or be very creative around the business model around local journalism yeah. and in a way that would be some, you're making a product that people like and at the same time they want to buy and that's also really good. Um, I think that's where it starts is are you making a great product just like you know you think of products all the time, I do too, like what's really good and what do people want to do. That's right. So, so let's talk about Facebook. Okay, sure. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Silicon Valley has always been kind of viewed as a fiefdom to itself yeah. uh, that makes its own rules. Yeah. And amongst all of the platforms, particularly the social media platforms, you have really singled out Facebook, I think, yeah. as uh, an especially egregious uh, offender. So 
um, maybe, maybe I, I, I'd love for you to just summarize in your words what the problem is with Facebook. The reason and, I focus on Facebook is because yeah. they're the biggest. I'm yeah. sorry, I'm not yeah. focusing them because they're yeah. the most egregious. Yeah. They're the biggest. Yeah. It's like, okay. again, you go, <laughs> why do you rob a bank? Because that's where the money is. Mm -hmm. Like, that's why I'm focusing on Facebook because they're the most biggest and powerful. And because it's the biggest, is it also the worst offender? It yeah. happens to be. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, I don't, I, you know, look, listen, Twitter, come on. You know, yeah. it's it's a three alarm goat rodeo fire over yeah. there. Like yeah. as far as I can tell. Yeah. And <laughs> and 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 you know, you have Jack sitting there going like this. <laughs> yes, neo Nazis. <laughs> they are a problem. I will not do anything about them, but they are a problem. I will let them run rampant over my system and do nothing. Mm. And that's what I get from him. So right. I don't find that right. particularly right. great. Do you, do you use Facebook and Twi no. or Twitter? No, I, I, I know you I have Of course I do. I use yeah. it as yeah. I, to look in what yeah. it's doing. Yeah. I use Twitter quite a bit, as yeah. you might see. I'm yeah. addicted to it. Um, yeah. uh, I, 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 there's parts of Twitter I love, by yeah. the way. Some of it's so wonderful. Right. George Conway is my new favorite. <laughs> I love George <laughs> Every day of the week, I love him. He's very funny. Uh, it's sick, but I love them. Um, yeah, I, the, the reason I focus on Facebook is because it's the most powerful, because mm -hmm. it's, it, it's the world's largest communication system in history. In mm -hmm. the history of man, there's never been so many people united on one, present on one platform, and never have they owned so many parts of it. They own WhatsApp, they own Instagram, yep. Oculus, whatever. Um, uh, that's an expensive toy right now. Right now, I don't mean it's not going to be a big deal. Um, but they have the world's biggest communications platform that they have allowed to be run like it's Escape from New York, like that movie, if anyone who's older knows that movie. It's like they've allowed, they've, and I've said it again and again, and I've said it so many times, they've built a city that they take all the rent in on and they don't provide police, fire, garbage, signs, um, pothole fixing. Stores, the restaurants are all tainted food. Like, you know what I mean? Like that kind of thing. They don't yeah. care to take care yeah. of their platform. Now, yeah. they're trying now and they're trying to figure it out. But I, equally, what's going on, you know, I, I, I very much have great regard for Susan Wojcicki, but I've been pretty hard on her yeah. uh, at YouTube. She happens to be the CEO now before it was someone else. Um, but I think Google is just as, has egregiously violated lots of things around privacy, around monopoly, around there's, they're too big, they're too powerful. I've for years have pushed, tried to push the FTC to like consider the fact that having 90 some percent, whatever percent of the search market is problematic. Yeah. You know, everyone didn't mind when it was Microsoft because <laughs> Bill Gates was so unpleasant. Right. But yeah. he, the fact yeah. of the matter, it's the same thing, even if they're lovable like Mark. Yeah. And so should one person, I'm not saying just Mark, because it's Google too. It's Google and to me the two, the, the two companies are the problems right now, right yeah. at this moment. Yeah. And it may change, because now Microsoft's great. Microsoft's a great pu public citizen, corporate right. citizen. Um, they're doing all kinds of really great stuff. Um, but you know, 10 years ago, I covered that. It was bad. It, they, were, they were misusing their power. And so the question is, should individual companies have this much power over this many people without any kind of guardrails? Yeah. And it doesn't mean break them up necessarily. It doesn't mean it's just they have they have no guardrails. And the and the key issue is is this um, something that they go crazy on when you mention and call you an idiot for mentioning it when you the Communications Decency Act, which I wrote about when it was formulated. I was there when they passed that legislation okay. in Washington right. covering it. Right. But there's a, there's Section 230, which is gives broad immunity to these internet companies oh. for everything that passes on their platform. <laughs> and so. Essentially, what they got was like, if you call on a cell phone or a phone, they're not responsible for if someone plots a murder on a phone. Of course not. Right. Mm -hmm. They think that's what they think they're, they're like. Oh, we're not responsible if people do this on our platform, except they are a media company. They're not like a telephone company. They're not a pass-through. Mm -hmm. They take a lot of time to organize and push you towards things. And they're a media company. They're, a manipu they're an advertising company. They're a manipulator of people, and not in a bad way. They move people in and out. They use all kinds of devices to get you, to get features and, and techniques to get you to use or to stay on things. Right. They're a media company, and they're regulated as if they're a telco, right? right. Right. And by the way, telcos are regulated. Yeah. And so that's my only issue is should they get broad immunity right. for things that they are absolutely responsible for?
Yeah, so I was gonna ask you about Section 230 right. uh, of the Communications Decency Act. So uh, you recently had Nancy Pelosi on your yes. show, and she said, you know, it's a gift that it these was companies, it was a gift that these companies are abusing. Yes. And, um, and it that sounds like good. you agree with that. <laughs> I just uh, loved that she said it. Yeah. <laughs> Scared the shit out of them. They're like, wait a minute, that's the Speaker of the House. Uh-oh. <laughs> the jig is up. She's busy with some other things, though. So. Do, do you see uh, ways in which it is being chipped away? Do you see a path where it might be chipped away? And, chipped and, away. And they're going to... They're yeah. gonna, they're gonna lose it. They're gonna lose it. Yeah. I think they are. Yeah. I think yeah. it's been chipped away with Pip, whatever um, the the recent. What are they? I can't blanking on that. Um, but they Fosta, uh, Fosta, and the other one. Um, you know, it, it it should not be chipped away. It should be thought of in the new age. Do we uh -huh. really want to give the most powerful people on the planet, the richest people, the richest people on the planet, mm -hmm. the most powerful companies on the planet, immunity? I, I, I don't know. No. I, that, yeah. I would like to give small companies the ability to grow. Right. Maybe there's a way to do it so that only certain companies over a certain size yeah. are protected. Mm -hmm. I, I don't feel like I don't feel like Facebook, Google, Amazon really need our protection anymore, mm -hmm. right? Yep. To make sure that they grow into big, strong, handsome men. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they're fine. They're there. And by the way, a few lawyers might snap them into shape. I'm not, I don't feel bad if a bunch of lawyers went after some of these people. So, so uh, you know, uh, Mark Zuckerberg recently came out and said... Uh, he is? He's gay? No. <laughs> <laughs> He's not. He's not. His, li his wife is lovely, by the way. Yeah. He, uh, he, he said that he wanted regulation. Mm -hmm. And you call that fascinating. Yeah. Um, what, is, what is he really saying in that... In that Op -ed. He wants regulation mm -hmm. that he wants, yeah. For, yeah. I would guess. I think yeah. he, what he, what he wants to do is throw up his hands and say, whatever, like you've taken, I made this Someone mess, you take care of it. I would like there to be a, 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 a government, corporate, and citizen decision together about how to do this. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if the government does it the wrong way, it will be terrible for innovation or to, you know, in this country. The other thing is if, if the companies do it, it's going to be terrible because it won't be strong enough. And so, look, every other major industry has been regulated, some not so well, some well. Look, we, we regulate the chemical industry, we regulate the nuclear industry, we regulate cars, we regulate everything. Now, you can make arguments with individual regulations, and you, this, there's too many of these, and there's not too many. But, you know, I'm pretty good with the seatbelt law. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm pretty good with the this. I'm pretty good with the cars have to have parts. That, you know, that kind of stuff. And so yeah. Congress has been able to do that over the many decades. You know, as incompetent as everyone thinks our government is, it's, it works relatively well. Um, and so the question is, what are the smart regulations that mm -hmm. would both foster small business innovation to create businesses and startups and take companies like Google or Facebook and not allow them to do whatever they want? Yep. And I think what they tend to rely on is we're really nice people. <laughs> so they're not uh, horrible people like the finance people, right? right? right. <laughs> but I don't care. They're powerful. And so they're going to naturally want to keep their power. It's just, it's just not, it, they're like everybody else. And right. I think we have to stop pretending they're not like everybody else. So uh, I'm going to ask you one last question in a second. But I want to just say to everyone, uh, we are going to open it up to questions from the audience in a minute. There are mics on the sides here, one over there and one over there. Um, so if you have a question for Kara, uh, maybe move towards one of the mics. And uh, in the meantime, I will sure. finish up with a question. Sure. So, um, so, you know, uh, we've been talking about regulation and, um, you know, what the government, what citizens can do and how, mm -hmm. these, uh, you know, how these companies should react. Right. Um, I want to talk a little bit about DC. So you moved. Yeah. You recently moved back to DC. No, no, no. I'm there okay. only part time. Okay. So you, so you, you go back. And forth. I go back and forth. Yeah. 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 And uh, you know, obviously, my kids live there, so I, I oh. go see them. Oh, cool. It's a really nice thing for a mother to do. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I have. A, I join custody, so I, yeah. I, when I have my time, I go. Yeah. So you, you know, the, the obvious thing about DC these days is Trump. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what else has struck you since moving back, in particular uh, with the, the kind of lobbying between the tech 
industry and... I was saying I run into a tech lobby yeah. everywhere I go. Yeah. It's like, oh, hello, tech <laughs> lobbyists. And they find me for some reason. Oh, Kara, let me try to change your point of view on this. I'm like, mm, no, uh, leave me alone. Um, they, y y you know, listen, Washington's operating as usual. It's not quite overrun in the way you think it is. I think there's still the sort of permanent ruling class that's always, has not, has not changed at all as far as I can tell. Same, you know, it's the sharks and the jets like ever, like pretty much. And so, uh, but what's interesting is, is, the, is the, sh the, the sort of subtle shifts in power going on now. Mm -hmm. Tech companies are all loaded up with lobbyists. Mm -hmm. they, they all are, again, they're just like everybody else. Yeah. They're not special. They have lobbyists, they, right. they have influence panel, not influence panel, they have lobbyists who try to get influence. That's what they do. Right. Um, they have events, they try to convince congressmen, everything, it's the same thing. So that's, it's just, it's just that they have more money and the better lobbyists and the better events, essentially. <laughs> um, otherwise, it's, to me, it's not a whole, I didn't cover politics for the Washington Post, so I didn't know that, but it doesn't seem, it, I, the swamp is intact. Mm. That's what I have to say. <laughs> it's just a little swampier than usual. Um, and, and otherwise, and, and, the, and the relationship between the press and the White House is pretty ugly. That, that is, I have a lot of friends who cover the White House, and it's, um, uh, I, I, I think Maggie Haberman should be given combat pay. <laughs> Sometimes I'm sort of like, geez, you know, the kind of stuff. You know, she writes something that's factual. They say, you know, it's not factual, and then it turns out to be factual. It's right. just exhausting. And that must be, I just don't know how, how sh people like her do that every day. And I know she, people have issues with Maggie, some of Maggie's reporting, but I just, uh, it, that, that is noticeable, the, the, the tension there. That's problematic. But I, I don't know if that's so new. It's just worse, that's all. You haven't seen a big change in it? Uh, I, you know, again, I, uh, I've spent a lot more time talking to politicians. I go see yeah. a lot of politicians, and I visit them. The other day, I went to see Nancy, uh, Speaker, Speaker Pelosi, um, at, uh, at the House Democratic uh, offsite, and then I spoke in front of them, mm. which was fascinating. Oh, yeah. So I gave a speech uh, I, telling them what I thought the big trends they needed to be paying attention to were. So she asked me to do that, and then I did a podcast with her also. Um, and uh, it was fascinating. Some of them are quite up to speed on stuff. Some of them are completely out to lunch uh, mm. about stuff, don't know what they're talking about. But that's like normal. That's sort of normal. Um, some of them are great, you know, uh, some of them have really good points. Like, it, it was interesting. I didn't do, the Republicans didn't invite me. Um, they should, well, they're just gonna agree with everything. And so uh, they all agree. That what was interesting about the House Democratic Caucus, my, I took my sons with me, and my youngest son, so funny, he goes, he goes, Mom, this is like America in one ballroom. And I was like, yes, it is, they're crazy. Um, but it was, it was an interesting insight into, into how diverse and interesting and difficult it is to come to compromise. It, it's just, it's so many different. There's Congress people, at least on the Democratic side, there's some that are very from conservative areas that have won. There's some that are very liberal. You got Alexandria Ocasio over here. There she is, you know, over here. You've got sort of that, she's got a posse over going over here and you've got the more conservative ones. It's, it's a really interesting, it's yeah. an interesting shifting time of power. Mm -hmm. Um, it's exciting, though. I find it exciting when all these new Congress people show up. Great. Okay, why don't we start over here? Uh... Uh, hi, Kara. Hi. My, qu my question is: Is uh, what is your assessment of Elizabeth Warren's proposal to break up the big tech? I'm companies? glad you asked. And what is your sense of how the other 2020 candidates are going to how they're thinking about these issues? Um, you know. I, I, I have a lot of respect for Elizabeth Warren. I think she's, she is the one with the most, pol she's clearly got the most thought out policies of any of the, that I can tell. I, re I read a lot of the policies that they bring in, all of them, not just the tech ones. Um, I don't agree with her on her solution. I think it's a little bit of a, of a hammer when it needs to be more subtle. Um, I see what she's doing. I think she wants the discussion to be started about tech power, and I think I agree with her on that. It, what was interesting is I asked Marguerite Vestager, who's been sort of the most, the thorniest person in the side of tech. She's in Europe. She's the head of the European Commission. I said, what did you think of it? I thought she'd go, great. She goes, no, I think it's not smart. It's the last resort to break people up. Actually, you can do taxes, you can do fines, you can do laws, you can do, she had other things. And so that was fascinating to me that she wasn't, uh, 
on board with that. But what, was, what I think is important is that there will be antitrust action against some of these companies. That's where I think you're going to see some of the real, uh, you know, I, I can't imagine Facebook could buy anything right now, mm. ever, for like a long time. And so that's where I think you're going to see, in, in mergers and acquisitions and in antitrust, I think you're going to see some Google around antitrust, I think there'll probably be some, the FTC looks like it's slightly more invigorated, not really. Um, but you might see that. Amy Klobuchar had a really interesting proposal to, to find some of these companies and then use the fines to invigorate the FTC and current government agencies. There's ideas of starting an internet agency to, to study these things. There's a lot of interesting solutions. I think some of her proposals are, I like that she scared the shit out of Silicon Valley. That I enjoy quite a bit. They go crazy. <laughs> Elizabeth Warren, she's not coming to your conference, is she? Because I had her two years ago, three years ago. <laughs> I'm like, yes, she might. She might show up. Who knows? She could be there. <laughs> ah, she's coming. <laughs> you know, I, she's super, she's super, super smart. She's, we had her at Code four years ago, and they just literally, it was like they, that someone was throwing, like, I don't know, they just were like, they just were, had the shakes after she left the stage. I was like, oh my God, she just has some ideas and she doesn't like you. Like, that's pretty much it. So I find her to be really interesting. I like her, I like her. I, I, you know, I, what's fascinating about her is that she's got all these policies, like policy, 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 super smart lady. And then like Pete, Mayor Pete, who I like, listen, I'm a gay, I like the gay. So, um, but you know, he's on the cover of Time and you know, at, on CNN and on the stage, they go, you don't seem to have too many policies. And he doesn't have any, like on his side, he has none. And he's like, well, you should know me by my values. I'm like, no, I'd like some policies from you, buddy. Like show up, like you just don't, just being adorable is not a good enough for me, like kind of stuff. And so same thing with Beto. I'm like, I, adorable, I'm done. I don't want adorable, I want actual plans and stuff like that. And so I like her. I, I like her on some levels. I don't agree with her on others. Hello, CPO. So uh, uh, before you're talking about how the uh, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act um, is no longer needed for like no, big I didn't tech. Say it was no, I don't know what's going to happen with it. I didn't say it's no longer needed. It could be disastrous for internet companies to remove it. But go ahead. Yeah, but uh, I, I guess I'm wondering like, oh, like, what's a, what do you think is a solution to that, given that, uh, that that section may still help startup companies who are maybe aren't yeah. as powerful? Yeah. So, so could there be a way that smaller companies get protected under it and that, that Facebook doesn't need the protection and it's just got to, like, put guardrails in place on its own, on its platforms? So is there a way, you know, you know a few hundred lawyers is going to stop. Suddenly, they'll figure out hate speech if they get sued. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you don't look like you have children. I'm guessing you don't yet, right? Um, maybe. I don't know. It's fine if you, if you do. Um, but if you give your children sugar all the time and let them run rampant, they're, they're, what's going to happen is not good. And so if you don't have any guardrails on these companies and they have immunity, why bother dealing with really big problems. You, they just won't. There's no reason to. Like, the New York Times is very careful about what it publishes because it could get sued, right? Like, or something, or, or worse, they, someone gets, you know what I mean? But, you know, Facebook has done a lot of sloppy things in India and it's led to many deaths. They're immune. That's not, I'm not immune. You're not immune. Like, we're, why do they get to be immune? That's all I'm saying is like, let's rethink it. I don't think we need to, necessarily replace it, but we sure should rethink this gift is what it is to them. Yeah. So, Lydia Kahn, I'm Georgetown School of Foreign Service, hey. class of 86. Hey, um, oh, right near me. Yeah, oh yeah. Oh, um, yeah. I'm out here working with the design school on post-disaster finance. Um, my question's more, I've become an executive coach and I teach emotional intelligence okay. and empathy in business schools. I would like to come back to the States, I've been in Europe 20 years, oh. and work inside a tech company. How do I get someone's ear? <laughs> inside, it, which tech company do you want to go to? I don't know. What? Oh, Facebook, Google, or, you know, the bad guys. A and you want to work on empathy? Yeah, <laughs> I really do. I Love really, it. we, we're sure. all human. I, okay, sure, if you say so. Um, so, uh, you know, it's interesting, I wrote a column in the Times about I thought that there should be a chief ethics officer. I just was throwing out the idea just to irritate them. That's really why I do a lot of this stuff. Like the other day, I'm like, nobody should own a car. 
It's so funny when you write it in the New York Times, everyone's like, wow, what is she saying? I was like, I was just bringing up the concept of what is life without a car going to be like someday, which we, nobody's going to own a car. And so I, the, I think what needs to happen is when, they, when they're getting into the design phase of building, building things, a lot of these companies, especially when they're, I just did a great uh, re-interview with Tristan Harris because he's got a whole new initiative, which is really interesting. Um, I did an interview with him years ago when he started this, and now we come back to it. You know, when you're, when you're over at Google and you're coding like Gmail, you're not thinking of the bigger implications, but at some point before the thing is made, implications should be thought of, and I think they don't think of consequences in the design phase. And I make a joke, and I've said this a hundred times, and I'm waiting for it to, to get out there, some things, that, is like, if you can think of what you're making as a Black Mirror episode, don't make it or remake it, or that part doesn't go into it. It's more of a rush, rush, rush. Just the way like the scooters headed out, they just dropped them in the city streets. You know, they just did it. And then, unfortunately for the scooter people, the cities were ready because they'd already been Ubered. And so they just, they just threw them in the trash, like that kind of, that kind of thing. And so they, there's, a, there's a proclivity just to build, 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 and just wait and see. And I think the thoughtfulness needs to enter the picture. So I don't know how do you get a job, but they, they do need more people that think throughout the entire process. Great, kind of uh, following the regulation theme. Um, I, I guess in your interview with Roger McNamee, Mac I can never say his last name right, but uh, he was talking about how all the politicians aren't focused on any of the like the non, I didn't give you my data, but you took my IP from where I logged in and then you catalog, you know, like all those kind of things. And so I, I guess, the two-part question I have is, do you think the politicians are going to pick that up at some point? Pick up the part about? S starting how their usage of data that you didn't like, right? You know, right. I made lasagna for dinner last night. Yeah, I but, do. But I logged in from these, like, three places. Yeah, I do think politicians will. And, it, but do you, like, who's actually going to set the regulations? Because, like, if, if you think about the, you know, the Senator We Run Ads news conference, it was just frightening yeah, yeah. how clueless. Yeah, there's plenty of dumb ones, 100%. Yeah. Like, it's embarrassing. What was interesting thing is if you go watch in, in Britain when they were doing similar hearings, although Mark didn't show up at them because probably they'll arrest him, um, was, that's not a joke, there, there's actually possibilities that he could go to certain countries and be arrested. Um, it's, uh, what was interesting is in Britain that people who didn't know anything about tech yielded their time to the people who did. And there's plenty of people in Congress that do. It's just that everybody is a ridiculous clown show over there. And so some person who knows nothing about tech needs to ask a question and ends up asking a stupid question. So they look, as a group, they look stupid because, I don't know, 40% of them are stupid, right? And so what, what needs to happen is there are a lot of senators, especially senators, who are quite up to speed on this stuff and very smart about it. I'd say Senator Burr, Senator Warner, Senator Klobuchar. There's a lot of senators. There's many congressmen, Senator Will Hurt, I mean, Congressman Will Hurt, Ro Khanna. There's a bunch of people who do know what they're talking about. And so I do Look, they, they've regulated a lot of things, and there's, there's plenty of people under them that know stuff. Um, there's not enough tech savvy in the government in general, as you can imagine, as, as anyone who's ever encountered the government knows that. Um, but I do think they're certainly capable of it, and they certainly, you know, Roger spends a lot of time talking to them. They can bring in people. Um, I've spent a lot of time in Congress this year, and I think they reach out to me quite a bit, and they reach out to Roger, they reach out to lots and lots of people on, on all sides of the equation, and I think th they're fully capable of, get, of grokking what needs to be done. You know, they did it in California with the Privacy Act, they, they can get to it. It's not going to be perfect. That's the problem, is it's not going to be perfect. But I, I have faith that they could do it. Thanks. So. Uh, thank you so much for coming to speak to us today. Uh, it's been fascinating. Your views. Uh, I have a question about media responsibility, uh, yeah. in particular with regards to how they handle uh, information and uh, source documentation that might have been obtained illicitly. Uh, mm -hmm. In his uh, book, The Perfect Weapon, David Sanger quotes uh, regarding the emails stolen from the Democratic National Committee in 2016 that they were like catnip they for journalists. They did. 28% of all campaign coverage across mainstream media outlets in the lead up to the election, uh, according to a study from the Harvard Kennedy School, was related to Clinton's emails. Yeah, I, that, that was really interesting. It's really interesting. I agree with you about that. It's a really, it, 
they got, they got played. That's really what happened. And they got played mm -hmm. because of their own interest in it. And like, how do you refuse it if everybody else is doing it? How do you not do it? it, it immediately, you tumble right down into, into the mud. Like, you just do and get used. That's what exactly what happened there. What was really interesting to me is everybody, listen, I ain't no fan of Donald Trump, but everyone was like, when the administration said, yeah, we're going to use illicit information we got from the Russians, it's OK, I, appalled by that. That's what the media used too. You know what I mean? So you're like, oops, like, can you, can you, well, he's the president, so he shouldn't do it, but should the media do it? It's a big question because sometimes you get information and you, you don't know where it's from, but it's accurate. So it's accurate, so should you use it or should you not use it? It's, it's a big ethical question, and I, I, I'm glad I'm not in a position to have to decide those things. Um, I probably wouldn't use stolen information but then I would miss the story. So I think in this, in this hypercharged media environment, these ethical decisions tend to fall by the wayside. In the old days, these gatekeepers would just put it onto the side and you know, we know better what to tell you and what not to tell you. And now, it's all, again, the lid is off. And so I, I don't know, it's a really, it's a thorny question, but I definitely think the media got played a whole bunch and you don't think there's been enough introspection within the industry since 2016 <sighs> I to, think to ask these questions? Individually, you could talk to people and they realize what happened to them. At the same time, I'm not sure they would have done any different. I don't know. You know what I mean? I think uh, someday in history, we will find out exactly how it happened. You know what I mean? There will be an ability to understand. You know, I think his, the pussy thing was happening and then suddenly the emails appeared, you know, it's, it was all dirty tricks. It was all political dirty tricks. And the media was definitely used in that. It, it, I, this is just me as, as a citizen. I don't, again, I, I'm not a political reporter, but I don't know what I would have done as an editor if that happened. It's the same thing with the Sony leaks, the North Koreans. Uh, that was another one. Like, do you use those? Do you not use them? They're pretty juicy. They're really real. Um, it's, um, that one was very troubling. We did not publish those, I think. We did not, because they were stolen. Much. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. Thank it you. Was, it's hard. It's hard. So definitely an ethical so question. Let's do one last uh, question. Sure. I'm fine. Hi. Um, I'm a Knight Fellow in journalism here, and I have two questions. The okay. first is, how, what, how should we think about what's going on at the markup? In where? The markup. The, the markup. Oh, yeah. you know about the markup? And, OK. And, and the second is, um, I, I'm, I'm from India, and I worry that, uh, of course, Silicon Valley doesn't seem to be accountable to the American citizen. They are. But, but they have, there are some laws that protect the citizen in the US. Yeah. But what about citizens of other countries who don't have domestic laws that protect them, specifically regarding the use of data and I agree. all of I, that? H how would you look at, I mean, uh, how would you go about holding technology giants accountable from, dif from the perspective of different countries? I just did a great interview with Carol Cadwalder and Maria Ressa and um, this woman, I'm blanking on her name, um, from India. She's a journalist in India who's getting really badly attacked there for some reporting she's doing on corruption, essentially. And Maria is a journalist in the Philippines who gets attacked by Duterte quite a bit um, and has had, had a lot of trouble there because of reporting she's done. Um, and one of, the, one of them, I think it was Carol, turned to me and said, you know, the whole world is being impacted by these American companies. Why can't the Americans take care of this? Because it's a global, they're global companies, but they're American companies, and so American laws have to take care of them. Now, I think you're gonna see across the globe much more stringent regulations on tech companies, even American tech companies operating there at least. You saw in Sri Lanka the close down, the, shut, the temporary shutdown. You're gonna see more and more of that. Um, depending on what the country is. You're not going to see, say, the Philippines do it because Duterte loves social media because he can use it for propaganda, right? You don't see it in autocratic places. It's fascinating. You see it in democratic, troubled democratic societies. Um, but what's interesting is what will happen in, say, Australia, which has been, Australia has been doing some interesting things. I think what Jacinda Ardern does in, um, in New Zealand, I think there's some stuff coming from there. On, on social media's role in hate speech. Today, Facebook announced it was throwing off Louis Farrakhan, no, whatever, you know. They won't get them all, but they're starting, to, they're starting to just do it. And one of the things that's interesting about them is 
a couple, about six months ago, I was meeting with one of them, either Jack or Mark or something. I'm like, you're taking them off the platform. No, we're not. We believe in free speech. I said, you're not a public square. You're a private company making billions of dollars. You're not, do you even understand First Amendment? Like, it's not you, it's the government. That, 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 they don't even, that, would, when you go to like a lot of these executives, and not just, not the top ones, they don't even understand the you know, they're like, free speech. I'm like, but you're, pub you're a private company. There's no such thing. Like, you don't have to. You can make rules. And so what, what worries me is they weaponize the First Amendment. They weaponize civil discourse. They weaponize and amplify. I've said this in the Times, which they got angry about. But, and don't have a, a very good sense of what is actually happening and hide behind sort of faux ideas of of it, you know what I mean? Like they're all, it's a lot of, you know, it's libertarian, do what you want. I'm like, they're even, they don't even understand libertarianism. I, like, I studied that at Georgetown, I know what it is. Sometimes I'm like, you don't even understand libertarian light. Like that's what I feel like. It's like, it's like, a, like, a, like a Cliff Notes version of a lot of these things. And these are very serious issues. The fact that we have a communication system, and this is why I'm, I, and by the way, I like Mark Zuckerberg personally. I think he's, he tries very hard. He's not not thoughtful. Let me just be clear. He's incredibly thoughtful. It's beyond his ken to be able to fix this. He cannot. One person who was unelected runs the most important communication system in the history of the planet, and he cannot be fired. Just think about that. Should he get more power? Should we give him more power? Should we let him buy more things? Should we let... It's just, you have to start to think about that. And throughout our history in this country, when, whether it was Carnegie or whether it was whoever, or John D. Rockefeller with oil, what was the answer? No, right? And what happened when you broke up AT&T? What happened when you stopped Bill Gates from the monopolistic practices at Microsoft? Millions of jobs, thousands of new industries, the ability of small companies to come up. There's never been a time in our history where we've taken action against two powerful companies where it hasn't resulted in more, better economies, more diverse economies. And then again, power coalesces again, and then we bring it down, and then power coalesces again. And, but it's, it's dangerous this time. And I think that's, getting back to your first question, that's why I think journalists who have facilitated this have really facilitated, a lot of tech journals have facilitated by putting these people on the cover and saying, you know, making them into celebrities and stuff like that. They're like, wait a minute. Like, I think that's what's happening. And so I think they, it's a big problem that now is everybody's problem. It's not just, it's not for Mark to solve and Facebook to solve or Twitter to solve. It's for our government, the citizens to demand it, our elected officials, our regulators, um, and these companies, and, and, to, and to hope that we can get them, everybody involved in that, because it it, it's going to matter. It's going to matter, or else we're going to have a noisy, partisan, it's, you can see where it heads if, it, if it's not stopped. And so I think that's the question is, how do you stop it correctly, and also keep innovation and excitement? And I'll finish on this last thing, is that if not, and I'm not, what was interesting, when I did this podcast with Mark, one of the things he he said, which I thought was very telling, was he said, well, you can stop me, essentially. He was like, you know, you can't stop, you shouldn't be doing laws that stop innovation and this and that. That's their argument. That's their typical argument. You know, if you let the regulators in here, they can't make all the wonderful things that we've made. And I'm like, well, kind of, you kind of benefited quite a bit. I can see that. You're, you and your 64 billion, I get it. Like, you've done well. But, um, you know, just like with Uber drivers, did all the Uber drivers do well or just the investors of Uber, right? It's, anyway, you could argue these things all you want, but what their argument now is really fascinating is like, well, if we don't run the internet, Western democracies, which started with China's gonna run everything. And let me tell you, you don't want China to run it for 100% sure. Like, it's a surveillance economy. It is the surveillance, the facial recognition, the use of data, the tracking of people. That's where it's going. Right? And we don't want that. That is something, we should not be in an arms race with China over facial recognition. Really? That's, that's not a race we want to win. We don't want to, we don't want to even have it in this country. And because that's not what our, our democracy is about. I, I believe following, tracking people's faces is not what our democracy was about when we founded this country. Um, and so what his argument was, was, well, you know, there's, it, it's essentially, I called it the G or me argument. Like, 
you either have them or me. And I'm like, don't like either. What's third? What's three? What's my third choice? And there is a third choice. And we can, we can take that choice. We can make that choice. It is not either Mark Zuckerberg or we end up with the government of China looking at everything of us. And so the, with the next, with, the, with the, issue, the things that are coming out, automation, robotics, advanced AI, um, self-driving, these are big things coming down the pike. This isn't Tinder anymore. This is really major things that are going to affect climate change, that are going to affect the way we live, food, living, congestion, pollution, everything. The ones that are coming down the pike are so big and so important, we cannot allow it to, to, to not be thoughtful about it going forward. And I think that's what I think about a lot. Because the, I wrote a big essay. You can read a 2,000 word essay on this if you'd like that I wrote uh, this week in, on Recode. But the stuff that's coming is so big and so important for humanity that we've got to think really hard about how we want it to go down. Because it could go down super super badly. It could go down really badly. And we could be in the middle of the Terminator movie suddenly. Not that. That's not going to happen. But, you know, it's, uh, we just have to be really thoughtful about what's coming. That's what I'd say. Thank you. Well, great. Uh, okay. Thank you so much. Uh, this, is, this has been fantastic. Thank you. By the way, I love tech. I love tech. <laughs> <laughs>